And Dr. Bachman is going to lead our discussion next. I will ask if you have a question, please go to the microphone. We are being recorded, so identify yourself and where you're from. But Dr. Bachman. because otherwise we won't be able to actually see anyone at the microphone. Um, <laughs> I, I'll just start off, and um, my question to the group is, what was a bigger obstacle for you, the technical problems you had to solve or the social obstacles to implementing your innovation? And, and manslaughter is a pretty big social obstacle, I would say. But uh, I think there's tremendous inertia was the biggest obstacle. In fact, when I presented the PEG at DDW in 1980, there were maybe 2,500 people in the audience in Salt Lake City. I can see them. It was like a field. And the, the funny thing is, uh, two people stood up to comment on it. The first person to stand up to comment on it was a surgeon. And he was from Massachusetts General Hospital. He says, I don't think we need this. This is ridiculous. We've been doing gastrostomy for a long time. It takes me 15 minutes, and I can make an incision and put the tube in it. Fair enough. The next person to stand up, I'll never forget him, God bless him, was Peter Cotton, well-known endoscopist, very respected gastroenterologist. He says, I only have one thing to say. I wish I'd thought of it. And he <laughs> sat down. And it caught on very rapidly. But you're going to, the same thing happened with Lap Coley. A lot of the academic people were saying, we don't need this, I do gallbladders very well, and I don't know, think we need to add this. You're going to encounter inertia from the people who are out there and criticism. I agree. I think um, without any question, the social part is the most difficult or it's perceived as more difficult because the technical part, you're so enthusiastic, you just want to do it. And the enthusiasm that brought you to do the procedure is what carries you through the difficulty. I mean, I've been doing laparoscopic whipples since 2001, and I can tell you that only around three years ago, I said, finally, the technique is down to a T. And all of those years are carried by seeing how the patients are doing well. But in regards to laparoscopic cholecystectomy, you were right. I was a later a, a resident, again, in my fourth year, and I flew to do the courses. And you would see at the very beginning, you have two types of people. Either the ones that were a failure in their practices and wanted a gizmo, and those were really bad to teach. I was just at the pig station. I was not faculty other than the pig station. Or you had the innovators, as you said, like the person that said, I wish I would have invented it. And they would come and they wanted to learn. And among the first group, there were very few academicians. One of them was Carlos Pellegrini. I knew Carlos Pellegrini, and I see him at the, at the back of the bus, and he was like one more person. And I was very surprised by that. Then there was a the middle batch of people that everybody that you know, wanted to learn had waited, or did. And then the last batch was interesting, because they were the people that were very upset that this thing had indeed succeeded, and they were frustrated that they had to learn it. And those, that group of people was very difficult to learn. So regarding, regarding POEM procedure, um, when I was uh, residency, I feel, I feel a little bit strange. So uh, laparoscopic, laparoscopic helado procedure, the uh, first step is to expose the abdominal esophagus, dissecting the uh, phrenoesophageal ligament. That, is, that, that process is not directly um, uh, solves a problem. And then after uh, putting the myotomy, after that, we put the anti-reflux, anti-reflux. This process is not directly related to the uh, myotomy itself. So most of the uh, laparoscopic helado procedure, this, we spend most of the time um, not directly to the acarasia. So we dissect the uh, normal structure and then uh, after destroying the uh, normal one, and then after that, repair it. It's, uh, I feel a little bit strange during procedure. That, that is a background. And then, honestly speaking, um, I, I'm, I'm so lucky. I'm a, I have a lot of chance to do a flexible endoscope. 
I, I like I like I love I like very much flexible endoscope. So so um, when I read the article of the uh, uh, J. Pashulich, uh, I think we can do it. So like that. So uh, first first step is a technical 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 technical. So uh, point out the uh, tec technical um, problem. We uh, we find out and then uh, s try to solve it. And then after that, of course, there are social obstacles, but <laughs> we have to, we have to, yes, overcome it. Is there anyone in the audience who has a question for our August panel here? This microphone. Please come. Mine's short. Uh, Gene Dickens, Tulsa, Oklahoma. Did Dr. Muhe, was he acquitted? Did he serve his life out in jail? Yes. Did he continue to practice? Do you have more? Uh, to my knowledge, he never went to jail. Uh, he was more than anything psychologically distraught. He was a, a very avid cyclist. He loved life. And in fact, he was the physician champion for cyclism. Apparently, they had a cyclist competition only for physicians. Um, uh, but he went out of the picture for two or three years, basically, because of all of this. I mean, when, when any of us has a legal suit, we get destroyed psychologically for a while. Imagine if they're telling it's manslaughter when you have done already 94 gallbladders and the patients are doing well. Uh, I'm Kai from uh, Dodge City, Kansas. And it's just a statement to uh, the panel here. Um, I thank you all for all the education you guys have given us and for being the leaders of surgery. Um, Dr. Ponsky, I use your gastric tube every month, many times a month. <laughs> and <laughs> you taught me for the last 30 years, so thank you. And you also gave me the membership in SAGES. Um, Dr. In a way, thank you for your poems and your innovation. And and Dr. Asman, thank you for your teachings over the years in SAGES. Uh, we talked about uh, Lab Coley. Uh, Lab Coley, um, I was uh, at the first SAGES meeting, 1986, in Williamsburg. There were only 110 of us. In the second one in Washington, D.C., there were 300. And we were at a little hotel. And in one of the corners of the hotel, Professor Paris had, had, a, had a little television machine, and he showed it to us. And that day, uh, Eddie Joe Riddick presented a case, the use of a gastroscope in Zenker's diverticulum. He had done three, I had done one. <laughs> um, they talked to Paris, had, I don't know if, whether he ever went to Bordeaux, but. Perisat invited us to come to Bordeaux to learn laparoscopy. But uh, that was the beginning of laparoscopes. When SAGES started, all we wanted was to secure our privileges for gastroscope and colon scopes, because the gastroenterologists were giving us trouble. Um, in those days, the, uh, the colon scope was invented by Horimi Shinya and his program director in Beth Israel. So uh, those were the f uh, forefront of SAGES. Uh, Dr. Marx, Ken Ford, I remember, uh, Dr. Bursey, all these pioneers, also you, and uh, I thank you all. Uh, from a society of 110 <laughs> people, now it's many thousands, like 6,000, 7,000, and I, on behalf of being a rural American surgeon, I'm overwhelmed that the society has grown so big. And I thank the panel for their leadership and the guidance. SAGES is the best surgical society in America, and it's in the forefront. And it has not only incorporated the surgeons, the residents, the students, and from countries from all over the world. So I'd like to thank all of you. And I've been very proud to be part of SAGES.
Final question. We get, we get lots of people who want to uh, invent, create, they think they have the latest, greatest idea, but oftentimes they come having just read the Wall Street Journal and say, I've got this idea, it's gonna make $300 million and I'm gonna retire. None of you talked about your innovations pursuing the money as your end goal. Will you talk about the fallacy of pursuing innovation for the sake of trying to get rich on it? Dr. Ponsky? Yeah, I think that uh, the true guy who does this is so excited about contributing a new procedure. First of all, you don't make money on a procedure. If you, if you invent a device, you're entitled to make money on it, and you patent the device, and you can make money on your device, and there's nothing wrong with that. So be clear. I don't pa wouldn't suggest that you patent a procedure. If you want to patent a device to do the procedure, go ahead and do it. So all of you do procedures every day. If you want to get a new harmonic, go ahead and make it. You want to do an anastomotic device, go ahead and make it. But the procedure itself is for the good of mankind, it's for the good of the patient, and you develop a procedure which has a concept to perform something on a patient. It's not about making money on a procedure. I don't think any of us ever even thought about that. Uh, now, Eddie Joe Reddick, and he was, there's no secret, he used to charge people to come learn. And they would be exorbitant. We covered our costs when we made a, we had a course, we charged a tiny amount of money and people came to learn the procedure. So there's nothing wrong with education. We make money at Sages to go on. So I think that's fair. But to charge for a, to, some people have suggested patenting a procedure. I don't think anybody's really done that. And I, I just want to add one more thing that uh, for all of us that love innovation, sometimes we are in an ethical conflict because you think, well, this has not been done before. And yes, you need to try it on the pigs and so on. But the day you start on a patient, I think there's one question, and it's going to sound very cliche, but it's real. And it has guided me through the years. The day you're going to start doing it on a patient, you need to ask yourself, would I do this procedure on a sister of mine? And think on a sister you like, just in case. Uh, it's a very difficult to me uh, to uh, answer. But the uh, um, Japanese insurance system is uh, totally socialized. So very good for patient, cheap. Very good for patient, but no good for doctor. Thank you all so much for coming to our session. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Thank you, gentlemen, so much. Thank you.